I really appreciate that you take the time to, co to come to this session. I earn my living doing software quality analyses. My colleagues and I have analyzed several hundred systems in different programming languages and different domains for different companies. And typically, we find a, couple of, a bunch of different problems. And one class of problems I want to speak about in this presentation is the class of problems that arises if the technical architecture doesn't fit the team architecture well. What do I mean by this? The technical architecture means how the system is decomposed in the subsystems and how those subsystems communicate with each other. And the team architecture means how the team is decomposed into subteams and how those te subteams communicate with each other. And not our, but the software engineering community ex experience is if those architectures mismatch, then a lot of problems arise. And in the last decades, a bunch of different analyses have been proposed in research, and some have been applied in practice. Now I've been working in this field for 10 years, and I want to show the experiences and the analyses and the examples we've found in practice. But before I dive into the slides, if you have any questions, please interrupt me directly. It gets much more lively if you are, don't wait until the end of the presentation. And it needs not be a well-articulated question. It can also be just a, a, a personal opinion or doubt. Und ihr könnt auch gerne auf Deutsch fragen. Ich übersetze dann die Frage ins Englische und Antwort auf Englische. I said that I'm going to present my experiences, so some background on me so that you can know where those experiences come from. I have two jobs. One is as a postdoc in the research group in Munich at the university, where I lead the Competence Center on Software Maintenance. And the second is as a co-founder of a consulting company that has 20 plus employees right now. And in the first role as a researcher, I'm mostly interested in which analyses are newly proposed, and most importantly, which produce information that's actually relevant. Because there's a lot that we can measure, because it's easy to measure, but not because it's relevant to know. And in my second role as a consultant and as a founder of a company, I'm mostly interested in what really achieves improvement in practice. Because there's loads of tools that are integrated in some nightly build and that are frequently executed, but nobody looks at the results. And just by measuring, I don't improve anything. So in that role, I'm mostly interested in what can we actually do that has a, like a positive impact on the software we develop and maintain in practice. And one last background slide. This is some of the companies we've worked with in the last years. And I don't have that for marketing purposes, but to show that there's very different types of systems we analyze. And at first glance, an embedded system written in C has very different properties than a host system written in COBOL or an SAP system written in ABAP. But all those systems have often different teams with subteams and architectures with subcomponents. So the problems that arise if those two architectures don't match arise in all those contexts. If I speak about team and architecture, the first thought that typically comes up is Conway's law. Conway already in 1968 said that if I have a, an organization that develops a system, I'm going to end up with a system architecture that mimics the organizational structure of the organization. And Conway is not the only one that commented on that. Eric Raymond, who is maybe more well known in the open source community, said that if you have two teams building a compiler, you get a two-phase compiler. If you have four teams building a compiler, you get the four-phase compiler. So this relationship between architecture and team structure is apparent in all those laws or jokes. It's not really law. I think he meant it more as a joke. So what the, these people say is that if you have like a team that splits into, into uh, three sub-teams, please excuse my bad sketching, then you end up with such an architecture. Like each team has its own component, and there are some dependencies and communication relationships between those components, but this is more or less what you will end up with. And what I'm interested in is what can analyses tell us about uh, how well do these links exist? How do the fit teams fit them? And are there any discrepancies between that? But maybe one side note before I dive into that. I said that a part of my job is being a researcher, 
So just because Conway or Eric Raymond say some snappy sentences about how those architectures should match, this needs not be true. And to be more specific, there's no single understanding in the research community how the team architecture should match the technical architecture. And I think there can't be one, because typically there's no one team architecture or one technical architecture. Often there's several valid perspectives on either. Maybe you have a technical architecture in the business information system with a UI, a business logic, and a data layer, and then you have a more business or domain cut, where you have different business units, and both perspectives are valid views of that architecture. So the point I want to make is not that if you have one architecture, the other one must look like this. But the point I want to make is that the relationship between the two is significant. And more specifically, if we don't get it right, we will suffer from a lot of problems. And so before I go into the analyses that look at the mismatch, I first want to show two simple analyses that establish what does the technical architecture actually look like, and how does our team look like, and how did it evolve over time. Because kind of the first experience we made when we ran those analyses in practice was that what teams typically tell us that technical architecture is has very little to do with what the implementation says that the architecture is. So I first want to look into how does the technical architecture look like, then how do the teams actually work on that code, and then I want to uh, take a step back and look at if I regard development as a black box and have a separate testing team. How well does the communication between development and testing work? And then in the final part of the presentation, one further step back. If I have the end users and they d regard development and testing as a black box, how well does that communication work? So let me start with how can we establish how the architecture actually looks like. And the analysis type we typically use for that is called architecture conformance analysis. And the idea is very simple. We use a lightweight notation to model the intended architecture. In this case, we draw components with subcomponents and policies that allow access between components. And then we map code against those components. And then the architecture analysis tool determines the actual architecture from the source code by building a huge graph where every single node is a class or an interface, and every edge in that graph is a dependency between the two, and then aggregates that against that. And so in the example of JUnit, you would maybe get some dependencies which exist in the implementation, but are not intended to be there from the point of view of the architecture specification. And we have our own analysis tool for architecture specification called TeamScale, but there's a bunch of other tools, some of them open source, that you can use to do these kinds of analyses. The JUnit example is just a simple showcase to show how the this type of analysis works. This is a real example from a business information system. This system is like between half a million lines and one million lines of code big, and it's a typical business information system architecture. You have a big UI component with subcomponents, then you have a business logic component and a data tier, and most of the policies go from the top down. And this is the intended architecture. Now, if we run the tool to get the actual architecture, you see a lot of red arrows, and every single red arrow is a, is a dependency which exists in the code base, but which is not supposed to be there according to the architecture specification. And if you look closely, there's even some from the database layer up to the UI. And maybe one side note, all these analyses have limitations. They show you data, but they don't show you what the data means. And here we see that there's a discrepancy between implementation and architecture, but we don't know who's right. It could be that the architecture specification is outdated, and we actually want a dependency in the code in this place. Or it could be that the architecture specification is right, and we don't want that dependency in the code. And now we have to talk to the team, or take a look at the code and see what that means. And in that case, this dependency from the database up to the UI was not meant to be there. Here's some code actually open Excel to perform some computation to then store the result in a database table. So in this case, the server could only be installed on a machine that ran Microsoft Excel, which was not the intention of the architect. 
And we've done a bunch of studies with that type of analysis. And typically what we mostly find is omission in documentation. Like especially if you start with a several years old Word document that has some images on how the architecture is supposed to be, then up to 80 or 90% of those red arrows are omissions in the, in the specification. But to our surprise, we also found bugs, places where, for example, a transaction component was circumvented or an authorization component was not called. So where you maybe could not roll back a transaction or were allowed to do the things that you were not supposed to do. But for me, the most important thing is that those analyses, if you integrate them into your development environment, so that you, after every single commit, or at least in every build, get an up-to-date picture, those analyses are a good catalyzer for architecture discussions. Because when we started 10 years ago, I thought that maybe there's one architecture idea in every head, and maybe it's not followed in every place, but there's at least this one common understanding. And looking back, that's naive. Maybe in a small team at, at the very beginning you have that common understanding, but it evolves, and it does not equally involve in every mind. Especially if, if you have a larger team, and everybody works in a different place, then without a tool you don't notice where you deviate in your thoughts about architecture. And those analyses help to see that quickly and be able to react on that. So, short summary, architecture conformance analyses show us how the architecture really is and all the discrepancies are, from our experience, valuable insights into areas where we can improve the code or the architecture specification. So, second thing, how can we see what happened in the team? And as we saw for the architecture specifications, often an organization chart is not really accurate in who really works on which part of the system and how that team evolved over time. And the data we can look at here is version control system data. What I've got here is a tree map where every single rectangle is a file, and the larger the area of the rectangle, the more lines of code the corresponding file has. And what I now do is look into the version control system, and for every developer that works on one file on one day, I color that file in one color randomly chosen for a developer. So what happens now is that Whenever every, anything has the same color, one person worked on that on that day. And we see that a lot of stuff happens. There are some areas of code where a lot of development takes place. Now there was a big red change where somebody merged a branch. And then there's areas where not much is happening. And what we also see is that we don't really get a good overview. There's way too much information at the same time uh, that's overloading us here. So what we like to do is aggregate that. And this is a Gantt chart, where time is on that axis and developers on that axis. And whenever one person commits on a given day, that person gets a little stripe here. And what we can see is that there are some main committers that do a lot of the work continuously. Then there are some sporadic committers that work every now and then. Then there are some developers that dwindle away. This, by the way, is from the open source part of the analysis tool I helped develop and our group maintains. And I'm the guy below. I did a lot of more work early on, and at some point I had to write down my PhD thesis and didn't have as much time left to commit. And then there's also blocks of work. This, for example, was a laboratory class where a couple of students worked for two weeks. There's a lot of activity in a, in a short time. And we like to use those diagrams when we analyze new systems to under better understand what happened in that team. This is an example over a longer time scale from 2007 until 2016 from an in industrial system. And there are some interesting patterns. And again, the tool doesn't tell you what happened and only gives you clues about what to discuss with the actual team. And in that case, the company who paid the contractor changed, exchanged the contractor. And this were new developers that didn't really fit into the team. This was the new team that started from a new contractor, and this was the poor guy who had to manage the knowledge transfer between the old and the new team. Or here, the same chart from a bigger system with a bigger team 
again over a long period of time from 2012 until a couple of weeks ago. And again, we see parts of the team were phased out, then several new teams came in, and there's also been a couple of developers who for some reason left the team pretty early on. So again, a lot of information which is easily available in the repository, but which can give us some understanding of what happened in that team. And again, it's not only to get an understanding of the team, but it also shows us some potential problematic areas. For example, this is from an, a, a .NET open source drawing program called Pinter, and this tree map depicts how many different authors ever worked on the different files. So the deeper the blue, the more different developers work on the file, which also means that uh, if something is displayed in white, either nobody on the existing team or only one person ever edited that file. And that means that there's potentially a problem of knowledge if those people leave the team, or even if they stay on, they might become bottlenecks. So this is areas, if you know them early on, you can maybe do by pairing or doing peer review or exchanging some people between teams. This can help you to get a better understanding of how to avoid potential problems. So one step back, we had the architecture conformance analysis to see how the architecture is actually like, and those repository analyses to see what happened in the team. Now I want to put the two together to see where do team architecture and organizational architecture not fit together well. And our observation is that often, if one team needs to change the code base of another team, and if that for some reason doesn't work, maybe the time scales are too different, or maybe there's code ownership issues or whatever, then typically the workaround is to copy large amounts of code. We've seen frequently that entire components or subsystems were duplicated to get the, team, get the code from the other team into one's own code base to be able to adapt that on one's own time scale and requirements. And because we've so often seen that as a workaround for team problems, we can use clone detection as an analysis technique to find uh, these symptoms to unroot the underlying team problems. Let me start with an example. Uh, this is again a code base. In that scenario, every single system on that tree map is from the same company. And every big red rectangle is a system boundary. This is a couple of million lines of c -sharp code. And every single rectangle, every single small rectangle is a file in there. And the clone detection is a static analysis that can find duplicated code. And what I did was run a clone detection and filter out all clones inside a system. So the only clones I will display now are clones that cross system boundaries. And to allow us to easily see which parts of code were copied from each other, I color the files that are copied from each other in the same color. And the colors are randomly chosen, but files next to each other are in similar use. So the first component we see is that uh, this part of code was copied here. And this part of code was copied here, and now this is the result of the entire analysis. Uh, you see that there's a couple of more areas that were copied from each other. And altogether, it's a couple of hundred thousand lines of code that were duplicated between the different parts of the systems. What happened here? We spoke with the teams, and originally, the development team was a couple of teams for the different systems and one platform team. And again, every team had its own component, and the platform team was responsible for maintaining the platform. And for some reason, the platform team was kicked out. And to alleviate that, or to give the other teams some way of coping with that, they simply duplicated the platform into their code base. And because that was some while ago, this is pretty scattered. If we look back further in the version history, then those clones or those copied areas are more close together, and now they drifted away. And is that problematic? Well, we did find a lot of cases where maybe one file would have a bug fix in Feb uh, February, and the other file, its clone, would have the same bug fix in August. And you would see from the version control commits that they had 
testers or users had found that independently and they needed to debug that independently and fix that independently. So there was clearly a lot of waste. But how do we alleviate that? Is it the best idea to again introduce a platform team? That's something the analysis can't answer. Maybe in a certain situation, it's from an engineering point of view, the best of all bad options to clone that code. Maybe the alternatives are even worse. But still, if we clone all that code, we have the problems that we need to do the bug fixes many times, and maybe all refactoring operations many times. And at least we should be aware of, the, uh, of those copies. And those teams were not. A couple of years back, that had been cloned, and then all the developers had been exchanged. And so there was very little awareness of that. So this analysis helped us uncover that and then allow the team to, to deal with that by introducing, for example, a clone management tool that would notify the maintainers of this area when somebody in introduced a bug fix here and vice versa. Any questions at that point before I show more examples of cross-system clone detection? Do we have any in the app already? Then I simply continue with another example. I have a second example of cloning across different applications. In this case, three, again maintained by the, by the same company. And this is one application, one application, one application. And this was uh, before I had the fancy visualization that colored every single copied file in the same color. So here, red simply means cloned. And again, we spoke with those teams. And there was one, de one developer that moved from this team to that team, and he brought some functionality with him. <laughs> here in those three components. And again, that person is not really to be blamed, because in that setting, there was no common component. There was no commons library that those three s systems shared where he could have moved that functionality. And copying is still probably a lot better than re-implementing or reinventing. But still, the underlying fundamental issue was that there was no systematic way of reusing functionality across different applications in the same team or in the same department. Third example, we analyzed the architecture of a product family. And in that case, it was a black box product line approach. That means that there's one area where there's components, where there's a team that maintains a platform of components, and those components are meant to be used as, a, as binaries by the product teams. So here's different product teams, and the products are meant to only assemble the different components, and then have maybe some glue code and some additional functionality. And the clone detection we ran was between the black box components and the products. And ideally, nobody is forced to copy between the two, because all the functionality that is cross-product is already in the components and perfectly abstracted. And I mean, I wouldn't have the example if we hadn't found any clones. So again, there's a lot of duplication between uh, this part and that part. In that case, between the components of the product line and the, in, in the individual products. And in that case, we don't see those big chunks of copied functionality, but a lot of fine splatter, uh, scattered clones. And again, we spoke with the teams, and it turned out that a lot of the functionality was not sufficiently parameterized. So maybe they would need more or less that functionality, but not in that exact same form. And because they couldn't get the parameter in there quickly enough, they again copied that into the product and then modified it a certain bit. Or in some cases, the abstractions were simply done too poorly, and some of the code had, be, it had to be copied here because the component didn't allow for better reuse. This wraps up the section on the cross-system clone detection. We've done that a couple of more times, and typically it's a very cheap analysis, it takes maybe an hour or two to run the cross-system clone detection, and it often give, gives surprising insights into what big chunks of code were cloned in the past. What I now want to do is take a step back and investigate the relationship between development and testing. Why do I think that's relevant? Because if we look at long-lived software systems, then typically most of the bugs are in those areas that were added newly or modified since the last release. 
So most testers or test managers try to focus a lot of the testing efforts on those areas that were really changed since the last release. And the analyses we use to investigate how well that works is called test gap analysis, where we want to find are there any untested changes. Sorry, this slide is still in German. Let me translate that on the fly. Uh, we have a static analysis that determines the changes between the current release candidate and the last release. And we have a dynamic analysis that captures all test coverage from all tests, be them automated or manual and in different test stages. And then we throw that together to see are there any untested changes. And again, I use a tree map to visualize the results. In this case, every rectangle is a component. The bigger the rectangle, the bigger the underlying component. And if I drill in deeper, then every small rectangle is a single method or function. This example is a C-sharp business information system. We've done it in SAP systems and also in embedded systems. And the bigger the rectangle, again, the longer the method in lines of code. So this tree map displays what changed since the last release. This was a pre-agile project. So they kind of, kind of 20 developers developed for like six months. And this is what they produced. Everything that's gray here is unchanged. Everything that's orange means code that existed before but was adapted, and everything that's red is new. So you see that there's a lot of heavily modified or new component here on the right-hand side. Now, I use the same tree map to display test coverage. Everything that's gray is untested, and everything that's green is something that was executed during test. And this data stems from a test factory in India, where I think like 10 testers had several weeks of testing and they tested thousands of manual test cases where they have documents that specify do this, then this should happen and so on. And this is the aggregated data. So a, a strong testing effort on that release candidate to produce that test data. Now the interesting question is how well do these match? And the answer is not so well. What do we see here? Everything that's gray is unchanged independent of whether it was executed in test or not. Everything that's colored is the stuff that's new or, or was changed. And the green stuff was executed in test, and all the red and orange stuff was not executed during test. So there's entire components that were, ent that were not at all touched during the big test that happened. And again, we spoke with the teams, and there was a fundamental communication error. There was one... Um, team that developed in Germany and one team that tested in India, and the Indian testers had only ever received the regression tests. Somebody f had forgotten to give them the tests for the new functionality. Sounds like a trivial mistake, but we've several times seen big test gaps where large parts of the system that were newly uh, programmed simply slipped through testing unchanged. And we've done a couple of studies, and for the studies we did, in those areas, the field bug probability is five times as high as for the other areas. Not surprisingly, because they have no, never been thoroughly tested. And what that team did then was do an exploratory test to fix that, where you simply uh, get requirements engineers and end users to test some of the stuff, even if you don't have test cases. And they covered a lot of the functionality, but still there are some areas, for example, this area here, where some functionality to export data was untested, or up here, where there was code that was simply not required anymore. Question. Yes? Um, maybe this is going too deep, but uh, I mean, the, the, the people executing the tests, so, so at what point did you get the, 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 the results of what was tested? Was it like a CSV file, or how did you uh, keep it clicking as some tool? Good question. How did we capture what people executed during manual tests? By installing test coverage profilers on all the machines on which manual tests were, were performed. So this is really automatically captured data. This is not somebody where somebody answered a survey or anything, but where we use profilers that are sufficiently lightweight that they don't slow the system down in a noticeable manner, because otherwise testers would complain. But thanks for the question. Any further questions on test gap analysis at that point? There's also automated tests. 
And I think maybe may, uh, in that system, maybe 10% of the coverage were from automated tests. The majority was still from uh, manually executed tests. Did the product yes. Did, did the product succeed? Good question. Um, they ran that analysis before they released. So they did that test phase before they released that. And that was a system that was in production, I think, already for 10 or 15 years when we ran that. And it's still in production today. Which is true for a lot of the mission critical systems we work with. They often historically grown software and they have some ugly areas, but they are important for the businesses that run and maintain them. And often because they are uh, somewhat old, they are not easily automatable, uh, automatically testable. Just one disclaimer here, just because uh, even if you test all changes, you don't have any guarantee that you don't have any bugs. As always, testing can't show absence of bugs. You can only see that you found some bugs. But trivially right, if you didn't execute code, all the bugs in there cannot have been found. So that's the simple idea between test gap analysis. I have one more example. This is uh, right now, this is test gap analysis that was uh, run continuously next to uh, a test phase. And so every single test map, uh, tree map here represents one single day. And typically what you expect is that the closer you get to release, the more green stuff you get. And at some point, however, what we sometimes see is that whoosh, suddenly there's a lot of orange or red stuff. Let me just repeat that step. Most areas were green, and then suddenly there's a lot of uh, untested or new code. And what happened here? Somebody merged a branch, a feature branch, into the release candidate right during the testing period, a couple of days before release. And again, the analysis can only say, this is what happened. I don't know if it's a good or a bad idea. Maybe in that situation, it's better to have that merge in there, maybe bring some critical functionality or fix some critical bug. But again, the test team wasn't aware that that happened. And if all that code changed and this stuff is entirely new, then testing should reflect that. And this is something that needs to be present on the communication link between the development team and the testing team. And in that case, they decided to leave that stuff in here and uh, did some testing to fix those gaps, to close those gaps before they released. Last uh, area I want to look at is how well do the requirements that the users have match what development and testing produce. And again, a pretty simple idea, but sometimes complex in realization, is to simply run test coverage tools in production to see which features are actually executed by the users. And this is obviously easier with server-based systems, where you only need to instrument the servers, than with fat client applications, where you would need to collect all the execution information from the client systems. So the case study I've in the slides is from a server-based system. And again, a Gantt chart. And this is from November until March. And every single line represents a feature. And if that feature was executed on a certain day, it gets a colored bar here. And you see that on weekends, nobody worked. This is a, like a business information system where only employees of a company could work with. So you see little activity on weekends, and you see little activity on Christmas. And we produced that data by identifying features that were important from the point of view of the guys who maintained that system. And then we identified characteristic methods, meaning methods that are always executed when a feature get, gets executed, and vice versa, where we know if a method gets, gets executed that that feature was used. And like the first interesting thing was like almost a third of the features were not executed at all in the time period where we looked at that. And now, again, without context knowledge, we don't know how problematic that is. It could be that those features are, for example, failover features, where you want to recover from a disaster. And if no disaster happened, then maybe it's not so bad that no disaster recovery feature was executed. So again, we spoke with developers and requirements engineers, and like from the 15 features that were not used, 11 were unexpectedly unused. So here was obviously a lot of functionality that was either not needed at all or at least not needed anymore. But again, uh, in practice, 
Typically, you need to run these analyses for a long time. In that case, this is only like from November until March. We ran that for over a year afterwards. And only after one and a half years runtime did they decide which areas they could safely delete. Because sometimes, for example, if you have a year closing functionality, you need to monitor certain months. Otherwise, you don't really know if you need that stuff anymore. I have two more tree maps from SAP production systems, each a couple of million lines of code large, each uh, between half a year and one year of execution data. And on a log scale, like the lighter the green, the higher the execution count. And if something is gray, that functionality was not used at all. And both in this system and in this system, this has, has like roughly 10 million lines of code. A lot of the stuff is not used anymore. And again, we had some interesting insights. I don't know, is anybody familiar with SAP ABAP code? Some hands, so let me just explain that you're not supposed to develop on the production system. You have separate development systems and you have to transport the changes into the production system. What we found here was that there was a code in a temp folder, which is not supposed to be there because this only exists on development systems. So again, this system showed some severe process violations, which would get them into problems with the compliance assessments. So let me sum up. A lot of the problems we see in our audits arise from mismatches between system architecture and technical architecture. And we have architecture conformance analyses that can tell us how the architecture actually looks like, and version control system analyses to tell us how the teams did evolve. And we have made very good experiences with the cross-system clone detection to see if teams did workarounds to change code they were not supposed to change, or to work around organizational issues that would prevent them from reusing code. Now, if we also use dynamic analyses, we can use test gap analysis to see how well testing efforts match development efforts. And if we can convince production guys to put those profilers on the production machines, we can even see where there's functionality that's no longer used. Uh, I want to end with a certain expectation setting, because one way to group those analyses is into static and dynamic analyses. And typically, and like the only difference being that a static analysis doesn't, analysis doesn't need to execute the system under analysis to produce its results. And typically, you find a lot more tools and a lot more research on static analyses. You find less on dynamic analyses. And that is not because the results of the dynamic analysis are less relevant. That's only, and it's also not because they require more effort or more cost to apply. It's only because for the guy who wants to sell you the analysis, it takes much less time to produce a result for static analysis. Often, if I uh, run a static analysis, it takes me a day or two to have some results that I can show to management. And it only takes a day or two to install the dynamic analyses. Or for a big system, maybe it takes months, but then it takes the same amount of time up here. However, sometimes I need to wait an entire year until I know which areas of the code really are not used anymore. Or for test gap analysis, maybe I need to wait three months until the next test phase starts. So for a consultant or a tool vendor, it's much more difficult to convince somebody to run a dynamic analysis. Same holds true for research. I started my research in dynamic analysis, and then I wanted to do the feature stuff. And then I noticed I would need to wait years to get data. And then I wouldn't even know if the data was good for anything. So I ended up doing my, my PhD in static analysis. Why do I stress that? Because if you work for companies that maintain their own software, then your cost, both in terms of money and time needed to set up the analyses, is the same. Like, waiting is free. And the results from the dynamic analyses are often more profound and more impactful for the teams that use them. So even though I am a consultant and a tool vendor, don't listen to the consultants and tool vendors too much at that point and choose the analyses that best answer your questions and not the ones that are easiest to buy. Let me summarize. We see a lot of problems that arise if technical and uh, team architecture don't fit together well. And there's a bunch of useful analyses that can help you unroot those problems. 
but the um, configuration and the interpretation requires some experience, and if you have any questions or would like to try some, I'm happy to help. There's some propaganda on our blog if you want to dive more deeply, and I'm also available for questions and discussions. Thanks for the time. We have a couple of minutes left for questions. So what is this, this, the standard case when you when 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 are you getting getting contacted? So so what's the your standard task when you work for such big companies? Is it or, or why do you do that? Is it because they want to know what they're running their, their business on, or because I think it's costly and it, it requires time? So there must be a purpose for them. What is the standard question we have to answer? All our stuff is free for open source and research use. So I think there's not there's no one answer to their questions. There are some companies that want audits, for example, because they, want, they buy another company and want to know how's the quality before they buy them. And then there's other companies that maintain their own software for decades, and they simply want to preserve their investment. And they want to step by step improve their internal quality and manage technical debt and use that. Then there's other companies that have contractors and want to see how their contractors work and so on. So there's different ways of uh, tackling problems. Are there any questions yeah, in the app? Yeah, one question for the application, which is, what tools have you used to generate the diagrams? Which tools did I use to generate the diagrams? Our own tool. Our tool is called TeamScale, which is the commercial part, and Concut, which is the open source part. And uh, the tools both produce the program analysis data and have the visualizations to produce those slides. And in the tool, they are obviously interactive. So you click on a rectangle and get the file, get the history, you can zoom in and zoom out, and so on. <coughs> PowerPoint is not so interactive, but uh, more robust in a demo setting. Is the duplicate detection you're doing based on the, abset, uh, the AST, or is it just based on what's available in the, ver the version control system? Excellent question. On which representation do we do the duplication detection? We have different algorithms that work on different uh, representations. We do use ASTs for the more popular languages. But every now and then, we get to audit a system of a language we honestly didn't know existed. For example, we analyzed JPunter, MTEX, Clue, and Magic in the last year. And for these languages, we typically, if it's a documented language where you can get some grammar information, we build a, uh, a lexer just to be able to differentiate between comments and keywords and so on to do some basic normalization and run on a token stream. And for some even more obscure languages, we simply do it on a text level and have some regular expressions that filter out some comments or stuff. And I've done my PhD on, on clone detection, so I'm always prone to also answering that question too long. But maybe one, one side note, there's typically it's easier to, to publish a new detection algorithm, then do some empirical stuff or show weaknesses of existing ones. So there's maybe 100 different clone detection algorithms. And each one works on a, or many work on different levels of a, a different abstract representations, be that on an AST or be that on a program dependence graph. And the more sophisticated the representation, the more expensive the algorithm. Because then you have to search for isomorphic subgraphs, which is NP-hard. And on the token stream, you just have to find identical subsequences, which is linear in time. And the disappointment is that you don't gain much by having more complex representations or more complex algorithms. So we mostly use the very simple linear time um, suffix tree algorithm. And we have some incremental algorithms now, which uh, have a longer runtime complexity if you analyze a long system, a long system history. But during development, you have to wait like a second or two to get up-to-date clone detection data. Sorry for the long reply. If you want to try this stuff, uh, anybody who's interested, I can give you a free license to, to experiment with that. Yeah?
So the first question, how can you integrate that into your tool uh, environment? Very easily, we support a lot of the, to get feedback, a lot of the typical version control system, for example, Git or Subversion or whatever. You simply uh, configure TeamScale to, to work with that because we don't need to in integrate into the build because we want to give even more rapid feedback so that after every commit, a second later you have up-to-date results, be that in the IDE or in the browser. And like which measures or metrics are important really depends on your use case. It's hard to uh, answer in a general setting, but if you want to look at code maintainability, our advice is to have separate measures that have a very concrete interpretation. For example, uh, we always use how, which percentage of the code is cloned, because then you, you know if I fix a bug, with which likelihood do we need to fix that bug in several places. We don't aggregate all our analysis results into one single measure, because that's typically useless. Then you know you have one quality index, but you don't know what that means. Did that answer the question? Okay. There was one. Duplication between Oops. between different uh, languages. I mean, you can it can be that you have different components with different languages working in the same system. How do you do? Two? Good question. How do we find duplication between systems written in different languages? We don't. And uh, I think even if there would be re-implementations of the same functionality, you wouldn't be able to find that with a clone detection tool. Clone detection is really limited to the syntactic level. Even if we use an abstract syntax tree or program dependence graph, we re really only find copy, paste, modify. We don't find rewrites. I've run one experiment where I ask 400 students in Munich to implement the same specification. And it had to pass the same uh, unit tests. And then I received 109 implementations that compiled and passed those unit tests. And then I ran, I, and I knew they were independently programmed. So in principle, an ideal clone detection tool should be able to tell that all 109 do the same thing. And I ran our clone detection tool and other clone detection tools from other researchers, and I think only in 1% of the cases did we find that the code was similar, and I think those were the cases where the students actually copied from each other. <laughs> so unfortunately, discovering re-implementation is an unsolved problem, and since, in general, showing that the code does the same thing is undecidable, I think we won't get significant progress here. But I think in practice we see copy-paste a lot more frequently than re-implementation. So the low-hanging fruit is really running copy-paste detection. Further questions? And thanks for the time again. <laughs>